Welcome to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asfalis Advisors and the Disaster Recovery Journal. Crisis management in today's world is ever-changing, and this podcast is our commitment to help you navigate successful outcomes for any crisis you may face. I'm your host, Vanessa Matthews. I specialize in providing insights and solutions for crisis, continuity, and resilience across industries from real estate and healthcare to terrorism in the airline and transportation worlds. No matter what industry you're in, this podcast will provide you the tools to build resilience in your organization. Welcome back to another episode of the Business Resilience Decoded podcast. Today, we're going to be talking with Richard Coughlin. He is the professor of management at the University of Richmond, and his episode today will focus on negotiations. Before we get started, I wanted to share a few resilience resources and reminders. The Disaster Recovery Journal hosts a new webinar every Wednesday, and you can be sure to register at the link provided in the show notes from today's episode. And as fall as news, keep track of the Road to Resilience program, as well as our upcoming public speaking engagements. You can go to asfallasadvisors.com slash public speaking. And lastly, if you enjoy our podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. This helps more listeners to find us and lets them know that you're getting value. So let's dive right in. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Vanessa. I'm thrilled to be here. How are you? I'm doing really <laughs> well. I hope you are as well. Doing well. So, so look, we met um, a few months ago, and I was intrigued by your background and your focus on negotiations. So I guess that might be a great place to start. Can you tell us a little bit about you and specifically how you got into the field of negotiations? You bet. Uh, when I finished my undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia, I went straight to California. I was fortunate to land a position with Hyatt Hotels. The job title was sales manager. What I found out when I got out there was uh, that meant I was going to be negotiating every day. And I didn't have much of a background in it unless you count the years I spent uh, working at Foot Locker in the mall, trying to upsell or something like that as background. Uh, but I got out there and got great training, uh, formal training. They sent me to Chicago for two weeks. And then I got tremendous mentoring about how we're negotiating very quickly. What I was negotiating on behalf of the resort in California was or Hewlett Packard or other high tech firms might want to bring a meeting to, to our resort or some resort. And I had to convince them that ours was the best site for that. Lots of elements to the negotiation, but that's really where I, I cut my teeth. And then uh, did stayed in the hotel industry for four or five years, went back for grad school. And coincidentally, frankly, they needed someone to teach negotiations at the University of Arizona while I was a grad student. And they said, well, you've, you've negotiated. So give it a shot. And uh, I guess 25, 30 years later, here I am. Awesome. So I guess a couple of fun facts. So I used to work at Finish Line. Oh, funny. The locker was the competitor. <laughs> you didn't have to wear a referee shirt like I did. Uh, no, but I had to wear like a Finish Line shirt and I always had to upsell a shoe cleaner. So <laughs> yeah. And then um, secondly, the other fun fact, back in 2017, um, I got selected to go to China and um, Arizona helped to sponsor that particular trip. So oh my gosh. a couple of places where we have a bit of commonality. Uh, it's great to hear. <laughs> so I know that you work with businesses to help them uh, conduct negotiations training. So I guess just a question for you is why is it important for organizations to be trained on how to negotiate? Well, I think the, the, the preparation for negotiation is really what doesn't get enough attention. And so I think a lot of these businesses kind of like me in the hotel industry, you, you find yourself having to negotiate and you do your best at, at, at the start. And then you figure out what seems to work for you and you utilize those tools for some amount of time. But then you bring in new talent or the business expands and the negotiations that you're uh, encountering are much more complex. The reason I think it's so important is because what we really need to focus on is how we're building relationships with other firms so that when the negotiations arise, they're done in the context of this is one of those relationships I'd really like to maintain or enhance. But at the same time, I need to achieve certain outcomes for my business. Yep. To me, the fascinating tension there is how can I be successful as a business negotiator when success means holding on to that relationship and getting what you need out of it? So to me, giving some attention to that kind of complexity is really where value seems to emerge for most businesses. 
So what I like about what you said is that it starts with a relationship because a lot of us in this crisis, emergency management, resilience field, uh, we, we are successful because of the relationships and the partnerships that we have. But to your point, this is also business. And so being able to understand what relationship are we entering into and how do we construct that in such a way where um, everybody feels like they're, they're getting something and it's hopefully mutual, if it can be. Well, the core of that to me and what's so fascinating about the business that, that, that you're in, what's the core of it is trust. And so if there's not trust kind of underlying in the background of the conversation, most negotiations aren't going to be fruitful. Uh, they're just not. And they're certainly not going to lead to second and third conversations. So all of the relationship building that goes on in your business or my business, all of the relationship building that goes on is really, a, for me, an opportunity to build trust so that when we get into the nitty gritty of negotiations, there's some level of common understanding about what we together are trying to accomplish. So I guess that brings me into my next question. What are the types of things that you see organizations are typically learning as it relates to negotiations or that they need to learn? The negotiations are more like puzzles than pies. Uh, it's something that we start with in the first hour of any of the sessions that we lead is to say, please, please don't go into negotiation thinking it's about a pie sitting between us that needs to be divided and I'm going to figure out how to get the biggest slice of it. What we try to say to them is, imagine that you and your negotiating partner, that's the term that we use, even if it feels like there's going to be some give and take. Imagine the two of you are sitting at a table examining a puzzle and the puzzle has a bunch of pieces that still need to be filled in. And at the outset, we might not know if it's a 10 piece puzzle or a 25 piece puzzle, but if I go in with that collaborative mindset, uh, and I also have to often take a break and say to them, look, I, I know this sounds kind of pie in the sky. I know this sounds way too, oh, wouldn't it be nice if we were all solving puzzles together? But believe me, I mean, I spent five years with tough negotiators at Hewlett Packard, Apple and Merrill Lynch and other great clients. They want to see how we can solve puzzles together. And what it means is I need to do a whole lot of listening. So I think the importance of listening the, uh, the view of negotiations, not as a competitive kind of, I'm going to get more of the pie than you are, but instead, collaborative mindset, let's solve puzzles together. Let's put ourselves in a position to have future puzzles to solve together. And to me, it's really about understanding the interests of the other party first. And every once in a while, you know this very well, Vanessa, when I under uncover their interests, I'm at a point where I'm going to say, we're probably not the best solution for you, but I know a couple who might be. That, that's part of the game too, but I've got to really listen for their interests and understand where they are and, and what success looks like for them. So I heard listening and I heard trust, um, <laughs> which is critical, I think, for any relationship. <laughs> um, so my question is, um, how, how do you use these skills from negotiations in your interpersonal relationships, whether it be spouses, friends, families, um, you know, teammates, how does that happen? I love the question uh, because it gets us for a moment outside the realm of business. And, and I think that at its core, the kind of work that we do is really about problem solving. So uh, whether it's with the daughter that we just dropped off in college, uh, you know, 3,000 miles from home or uh, with, with others uh, who, who, you know, we're in, encountering in our daily lives. To me, it's about understanding where I can give without too much cost to myself. Are there places where I can help others solve problems? The second piece is really that very often we are better off not not keeping score. And I think in negotiations, we tend to want to do that and say, listen, I gave here, so you better give here. When we're aiming to achieve business outcomes, of course, there's a scoreboard. Uh, we have to look at profitability, or we have to look at sustainability of the business, or we have to look at retention of our employees. All of those things matter. But if we can get to a point in a relationship with another with whom we're negotiating at work or away from work, we're, we're not keeping score, but instead each party is looking to figure out how they can help the other solve their interests, we're in a pretty good spot, both for the relationship to continue and for the relationship to blossom in a way that, you know, now we get to solve new problems together. Now I'm starting to trust you with things I didn't a year ago or two years ago or three years ago. So all of those things come into play, again, at work and away from work. At least that's the way that I view it. So um, when I met you a few months back, um, 
we talked a little bit about personal experiences as a small business with negotiating with larger companies, right? And a lot of our podcasters, they're in the resilience, crisis management, disaster recovery space, um, but they also purchase goods and services potentially from some small and mid-sized companies. So for the podcasters there, um, one thing that I've noticed is um, some larger companies can be a little bit taken aback when they need a small business that just doesn't agree to some of the contractual terms um, that happen throughout that business process, right? And then understanding at which step in the process do we finally arrive at what's the contract, what's the conversation, what are we going to agree to, what are we not going to agree to? So I guess my question might, might be a little bit more focused on this profession and your, your answer may not change, right? But I guess what, what recommendations can you offer to our subscribers um, as they're working with other businesses and, hey, I'm the business continuity manager or director, but I work for big company X who has this process, but I have a great relationship with my vendor partner who you also represent an organization. How does that person who's kind of in the middle that's facilitating that, how do, you know, what, what are some, some tips and recommendations that, that, that you can provide them? The first would be to stay curious on both sides of that relationship. And by that, I mean, continue to ask questions, continue to probe so that you can better understand where you fit within the, not only where you fit today, but where you could fit in the future uh, within that relationship. The second thing that I would say is, take stock of where your bases of power might be. I think small businesses generally view themselves as relatively powerless. That is, they're going to you know, be at the whims of the larger firm. And if the larger firm says, this is the deal, you better take it. Too many small firms that we encounter say, I better take it, right? And we say to them, no, think about the bigger picture. Uh, know where your base of power is, know why they're on the phone with you or why they contacted you and understand what expertise are you bringing to it? What urgency can you bring to it? What connections can you make for them that would be very, very valuable to them longer term? Each one of the things I just described is a potential base of power. And I wanna put you in the mindset to say, we are powerful uh, in some way in that relationship. Then at the very least, you're not conceding each and every time that the big firm says, and this, and this, and this. Uh, our conversation a few months ago helped me understand, Vanessa, you've gotten to the point where you say, no, uh, we're not going to accept that. I've got a different potential offering solution to advance to you. Our experience has been that most of the bigger firms actually appreciate that. And if you're in the business of helping them through a crisis, if you're in the business of helping them be resilient, showing them that you're resilient too, to me, is powerful evidence. And you ought to take stock of that. Keep that in mind as you're negotiating. Don't, don't worry so much about we've got to have this, this piece of work. The work will come to you uh, if you're confident in, in what you're bringing to the relationship. I saw a quote the other day that said, competence has a best friend called confidence. <laughs> you can't be, you can't have one without the other. So I love that. Um, <laughs> so my last question for you, what are the top three things that you think business leaders can do right now to improve their negotiation skills for either themselves or for their teams? The first would be to take a really hard look at the businesses that you're doing business with on, on, in either direction. So either you're serving supply to them or you're, you're purchasing other things. Figure out the five, five or 10 most important relationships that you have. And here's what I would do. Devote whatever time you can to thinking about where are they headed? What's important to them today and what's going to be important to them in the future? That background is going to put you in a very good place to negotiate. The second would be to, to take a look at how you're defining success in the negotiation. How much of that has to do with specific business outcomes? And are you in some places actually documenting that a, a, you know, a relationship saved or a relationship enhanced is also a tally in the success category? Sometimes giving a little Sometimes giving a little at the outset to, to get into the relationship is worthwhile. Uh, longer term, we've got to get back to, to, to getting business outcomes. And the final thing would be get comfortable with silence. Mm. You need to get comfortable with silence. You need to get your teams comfortable with silence. All of us have way too much stimuli uh, in a day, on our daily basis. And what I've found is that 
the most successful negotiators are extremely comfortable with 30, 60, 90 seconds of silence, both so they can think and so that they put the other party in a position to share a little more information that might be valuable to us. Wow, that was a uh, keys right there. So, <laughs> so here's my takeaway. We talk a lot about risk management on this podcast, but understanding how to negotiate is also a way to help you manage risk. And no matter if you're applying for a job, um, if you are a company that's looking to do business with another organization, um, we're always negotiating, in my opinion. I mean, you know, whether I want pizza or salad tonight, that's a negotiation in my house. <laughs> <laughs> and I've learned so, to listen, yield. Whatever others want is just fine with me. <laughs> right? So thank you so much for joining us and for stopping by on our podcast today. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you for listening to the Business Resilience Decoded podcast, brought to you by Asphalus Advisors and Disaster Recovery Journal. Make sure you check out the show notes for this episode to see all the upcoming events, programs, and ways we can support you. Make sure you subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts, leave us a review, and share it with a friend. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you in the next episode.